This time we're taking a look at Nintendo Power number 39 for August of 1992. Last time we had a video game sea change with Street Fighter 2. This time we've got a app on video game consoles that does the same thing. Let's get started. Our cover title this issue, since it isn't exactly a game, is Mario Paint with a cover that is a diorama and a nice one at that. Oh, diorama covers, how I missed you. In the letters column, the writers have a question. Do your parents, in particular your mom, play video games? And in response, we have letter writers who are parents and who are writing about what they're playing. First game of the issue is Gargoyles Quest 2 on the NES, a sequel to Gargoyles Quest on the Game Boy. The article on the game is a map of the first overworld, along with maps of each of the worlds from the game's first level on. Um, on. Well, first off, this game plays much better than Gargoyles Quest for the Game Boy. We have a wider field of view, which means less blind, blind jumps, but it's not without problems. The game only allows one shot on screen at a time, and you can't crouch, which makes shooting enemies rather difficult, especially enemies who are low to the ground. This is rather disappointing, as you can have multiple shots on screen at a time in the NES version of Ghouls and Ghosts and in Contra, which are much earlier games than this. Combine this with some smaller enemy sprites, you have a game that can be fun, but lacks some of the polish that other games this late in the NES's lifespan has shown. Next up is Casino Kid 2, another collection of casino games where you're traveling the world trying to beat various professional gamblers at roulette, blackjack, and poker. Casino Kid 2 is a pretty good casino game in large part because the game fixes one of the big problems that most video game casino game collections have. No tells. Opponents will say specific lines of dialogue based on what they'll do next, and with opponents who focus on roulette, they'll give clues on what the next number will be based on their dialogue. I'd say this is probably the best casino gambling game on the NES, and if you're only going to get one game in this genre, this is certainly the one to get. While the Contra franchise has debuted on 18-bit consoles, or 16-bit consoles rather, with Contra 3, it still has one last hurrah on the 8-bit front with Contra Force, which is designed around co-op, either with a second player or with an AI-controlled companion. The article has maps the first three stages, and notes on stages 4 and 5. The problem with Contra Force is that while different characters have different abilities and different weapons, you can't particularly switch between them while you're playing. Once you pick one, you're stuck with that character for the rest of the game and lets you start over. It is kind of disappointing, although this is a system that will show up later if I was to cover Genesis games with Contra Hardcore. Otherwise, the game is still pretty interesting. Each character has a weapon upgrade system similar to the upgrade path from Gradius, which is interesting and works very well, because each character's upgrade path is different from each other, Thus, as you play the characters, you can pick out which one best fits your playstyle. Being able to switch between characters on the fly would make this a much more interesting game, in a long part because you'd reach, make it easier to, once you reach particular points in the game, to go, okay, I need to be using this character, this character's abilities are ideal for this next challenge coming up, and then switch back to another one as you make your way through it. Make for an interesting sort of puzzle-solving scenario in addition with the shooting. In the classified information column, we have a code for mirror matches in Street Fighter 2. In the Link to the Past comic, we are introduced to Link's rival, Rome. Moving into Game Boy games, we have Kirby's Dreamland from HAL Labs, the debut of Kirby. We have a rundown of each of the power-ups, though Kirby in this game does not have the ability to steal powers by eating enemies. We also have maps of the first four stages and notes on the last level. I'm not the kind of guy to make a big thing about how experienced I am at playing video games, as quite often I suck really bad at video games. That said, I probably could have captured a complete playthrough of this game with no cheats and no save states were it not running into a time limitation with this particular run. Anyway, this game plays incredibly well, the controls are very intuitive, and the difficulty is kind of on the easy side, and the game is also on the short side, and I'm not sure if that's okay or not. On the one hand, this means that with enough practice, you could probably beat this game in one car ride. Which means, depending on it, how experienced you are in games, it's entirely possible, depending on the distance from where you live to the store where you bought the game, that 
back in the day, you could have gotten this game and beaten it on the drive back from the store where you bought it. Which, depending on the game's price point, might mean that you had just beaten your one video game for the month already, which kinda sucks. Weirdly enough, this actually makes the game a better fit for modern portable gaming and things like the 3DS Virtual Console, because it makes a situation where you could buy this game for about the price of a mocha much more appetizing or appealing, because there isn't the bad taste in your mouth afterwards of, oh, you beat your game in, beat the game in one run on the first try, possibly even in under an hour, which basically, in this case, I mean, you're getting about the value of a mocha out of your gameplay, game experience. Next up is Laszlo's Leap, which is a Game Boy version of the board game version of Solitaire. We get notes on a few board configurations. So the version of Solitaire used in Laszlo's Leap is a variant on the board game Fox and Geese, where the pieces on the board must jump each other until all pieces save one are captured, and the one piece remaining is in the very center square of the board. It's a very well executed puzzle game with some cleverly designed puzzles that had me definitely thinking, and with a very good escalation of difficulty. And I'm also pleased to see that the game has some functionality allowing the player to save their progress and continue later, as opposed to having to beat everything in one sitting. It's a really well done puzzle game, and I'm surprised that we don't see basically adaptations of this particular game out now, more regularly, in particular on mobile devices. We have another word puzzle game with Wordtris, which is Scrabble meets Tetris. Well, all that Wordtris really has in common with Tetris is the falling blocks part. They aren't falling in clusters, they're just falling one at a time. Your goal is to get the letters to form words, with the player getting extra points if you complete a five or six letter word posted on screen. The problem is that the six letter word that's posted on screen often contains fault smaller words within it, like fun within funny. So you have to be really careful in what order you put the letters down in before you complete the word. Unfortunately, because of the small screen on the Game Boy and how large the tiles have to be in order to be legible, this means you have an incredibly small playfield. I can't help but think this game would fare much better on consoles rather than on a handheld. Next up is our coverage of Summer CES, with notes on announcements from Nintendo and various other publishers. In Super Mario Adventures, our heroes have bested Bowser and are returning to the Munchroom Kingdom, or would if Bowser didn't kidnap the princess again before fleeing into a ghost house, because this is a part of Super Mario 3 and World that we haven't covered yet this game, this comic. In Counselor's Corner, we have tips for getting started in Draken, along with some tips for solving some of the puzzles in Boxel. We've covered every Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles game thus far, so it's time for the Turtles' first outing on the Super Nintendo with Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 4, Turtles in Time. The article gives a rundown of the game modes, including a time trial mode and a fighting game mode similar to the Versus mode from some of the Double Dragon games. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 4 is a game which history has been kinder to than Turtles 3, the Manhattan Project. I can attribute this to the fact that TMNT 4 not only has a similar control scheme to TMNT 2, but the first few levels are structured very similar to TMNT 2. Hell, aside from some of the aerial aspects of Baxter Stockman's movement and the size of the health meter, the first two levels and first two bosses play kind of similarly, with a building under construction and a boss who has an aerial and then running horizontally across the screen uh, machine gun pattern as the boss, and then going into the street, fighting an enemy who runs around and does a similar machine gun pattern you can do it, um, for the second level. So if I'm not clear, this game plays incredibly well and is absolutely worth your time. And I'd say, with the amount of character to this game, I might even call TMNT4 a better brawler than the original Final Fight. So next up is Wings 2, Aces High, a World War II flight sim. And I really don't remember Wings 1 getting covered in Nintendo Power. Not even making the top 30. It may be a number numbering carried over from the PC release. 
There are notes in the article on the five playable pilots, along with information on how to be a better dogfighter. We also have descriptions of the the mission types, rather two of them, bombing and strafing. Wings 2 is a game that I wish controlled better. The main problem I have with this game is the camera angle and the rather counterintuitive controls. In dogfight and strafing mode, you have a camera angle that puts you behind the back of the plane, which is what I call afterburner view. Now in bombing mode, you have a top-down perspective, like in Xevious, so I'm going to call that Xevious view. But the two different control modes, um, or views, afterburner and Xevious, have different control schemes. For example, the left and right bumpers move you left and right on screen in afterburner view, but if you're in Xevious view, they appear to drop bombs. The Y button fires bullets, unless you're in bombing view, in which case it doesn't really do anything. Graphically, the game looks great, I just wish the game controlled better. And since there's no way in game to view the control scheme, even if you could remap it, or couldn't remap it, you still are in a situation where if you don't have the manual, or because you've lost it, or you bought the game used, or you rented it, and when you rented it didn't have the insert with the controls, you're kind of out of luck unless you basically experiment a bunch, put yourself in a really bad situation, and start the game over from scratch. That said, it is interesting playing this game to note that we are approaching a point in the development of games as a medium, where it's becoming more and more important of a, to have a description of the game's controls in the game, because we've gone from effectively a four-button plus D-pad controller on the NES to a, well, eight-button plus D-pad controller on the Super Nintendo, with much more going on because the systems can handle so much more and so many more things that your controller can do, it's important to have a way to quickly reference how the game works in a pinch. And now we come to our cover app, Mario Paint. We have our intro to the mouse, along with notes on each of the tools. Mario Paint is a thing that is really ahead of its time, but also has a fatal weakness. So the Famicom had the Famicom Disk System, which let you save your creations outside of a cartridge, or outside of the software itself. The N64 had the underutilized N64DD, which is effectively the Famicom disk system for the N64, but with what were effectively zip disks. Now, the Super Nintendo was going to get a CD-ROM peripheral, but the Super Nintendo CD-ROM, I feel, was, would not be enough to let you get the most out of this app, because ultimately, the Super Nintendo CD-ROM, even if it had come into existence and gotten mass market sales, would have been a read-only device. Mario Paint is an amazing app. It is an amazing program. It puts art tools in terms of drawing and in terms of creation of music in the hands of anyone without having to have MIDI music editing software on your computer, without having to have a particularly good um, drawing program on your PC, assuming that you had at this point in, his in time a PC with a mouse in the first place. And this would put all those tools in the hands of a consumer at a possibly more reasonable price. But you're using a cartridge on your Super Nintendo, or if you're doing it now on a retro clone console, you're using it as you would have used it back in the day, you can't get your work off the system. If you want to share your music, you have to hold a tape recorder up to your television, or other audio recorder up to your television. If you want to share your art, you have to have take a photograph of your television screen. The only way other than that would be more recently, if you had a TV tuner card on your computer. Or had your television basically outputting through a recording device like a VCR or whatever, so you could record the game that way, or record your art that way. 
what would really let the player get the most out of the software would be something that would let you save your cre music creations as a MIDI file or even a WAV files or your artwork as a GIF or bitmap file and take that on a floppy diskette on a three and a half inch floppy which is the standard at the time this game came out the software came out take it to your computer and share it with others to print it out to play it on your computer to take it to school and shit or whatever and share it that way this is particularly noticeable because at this point in history where this issue of Nintendo Power is coming out we are in 1992 we are at a point where more and more schools, more and more homes, are having computers. Even if they don't have internet connections, students have, just have, at school, access to computers. Particularly Macintoshes at this point. Mac, um, Apple is doing a, was doing a big push to get Macintoshes in schools. And... Having the ability to save your work to a floppy disk would be an extraordinary and revolutionary and would have really been way, way ahead of its time. Decades ahead of its time. And it would have been a spectacular thing for Nintendo to have done. But sadly, we didn't get that. Ah oh, well, such is life. In Nestor's Adventures, Nestor is playing Street Fighter 2, and the tip is that Sonic... The Sonic Boom from Guile is best on slower enemies with a shallower jump height. Conversely, if you are fighting against Guile, it is a move that you can jump over, particularly if a character with a higher jump height, like Ryu, or if you've used the cheat to play as the bosses, as Vega. Moving on. In the now playing column, among the also rans is the Super Nintendo versions of Clue and Super Bowling. In the top 20 column, Street Fighter 2 is in the top 20 and is almost in the top 10. In the Celebrity Player Profile, we have gotten unintentionally topical as Will Smith and DJ Jazzy Jeff are featured. Smith's career path is very well known, and as of the time of this recording, Suicide Squad, featuring Will Smith, will be out in a few months. Actually, at the time this episode goes out, it'll be out in a few months. Now, Jazzy Jeff is still recording and producing, and occasionally performs with Smith every now and then. Wrapping up the issue, in Pack Watch, Konami has Axley coming out for the Super Nintendo, and we're getting a bit more coverage of the import side of things, and in Japan, we have a look at Parodius, once again, also from Konami, and also being a shooter. For picks of the issue, I recommend getting Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 4. Brawlers are always more fun with friends, and with the additional gameplay modes, including head-to-head -head multiplayer and sort of fighting game mode, there's a lot here to enjoy. And as far as Mario Paint goes, play it in an emulator, or if at some point Nintendo puts out a version of the game on, say, Wii U, where... It lets you export your music and your pictures to something that you can share online, or share with friends, or share through the Miiverse. Play it that way. So that way, you can, once you've created something cool, share it with people, as opposed to just having it locked in the cartridge in some form or another. Once again, thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe to this channel. Subscribe and get you notified when future episodes come out. And liking lets me know that you enjoyed the episode. The video on the right will be of the previous episode of Nintendo Power Retrospectives, if you want to go see what I reviewed previously that on that show. And the video on the left will take you to the previous episode of Breaking It All Down, while well, you'll get to see what I covered there. And below that will be a link to my Patreon page if you wish to back the show. 
Backing the show can get you a mention in the credits, and also, depending on your level of support, you can determine what I do future Let's Plays of on Breaking It All Down and what else I review on that show as well. So go ahead and click on that and back the show. Also, backing the show helps me get the show out more often and improve the production quality of the show, which is good for everybody. Once again, thank you very much for watching, and see you next time.